I actually don't miss the fitness industry. I spent, I spent a decade in the fitness industry and I'm so happy that I don't do people's nutrition anymore. I don't do any of that. I just take care of me and that's that. Why is that? Why do you not miss it? Uh, it's just overanalyzing data. Um, why do you not miss it? I think I got a little cynical. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a little cynical because I did a lot of coaching. I did a lot of working with athletes at a high level in the fitness industry. And I started finding this, there was this habit that I, not this habit, but this pattern that I found. Yeah. The pattern that I found was people would come to me to turn professional, be a professional bodybuilder, a professional bikini competitor, a professional figure comp competitor, and then they were gone. I wanted to coach at the high level, at the professional level, at the top of the professional circuits. Okay. But for some reason, it was weird. Like there was just this no loyalty. Maybe there was this thing in the industry where it's like, well, if you want your pro card, work with Chris. You know, but then once you get it, you you're good. Go on. Find someone else or like, what? I can do it on my own. yeah. <laughs> And what am I going to do? Sign them into contracts? You know, like yes. you're an athlete. Like it's lifelong, gonna, life, lifelong yeah. contract. Yeah. You have to give me five years and yes. your money. Yeah, exactly. You and know? blood. <laughs> nah, but like, and then like having gyms, you know, having a gym. Um, I found that I was in some of the worst shape of my life as a gym owner. Um, mm -hmm. because it was always about everybody else. And and I'm a really selfless dude. And I'll put everybody else priority when it comes to these sorts of things. However, mm -hmm. I have to keep myself in shape. So it was like uh, to perform at a high level, I need to be in shape. So, um, and I and I know that about myself. I know that if I stay between two hundred and two hundred and ten pounds, ideally two hundred and six, two hundred and seven pounds, which is basically where I sit at right now, I perform at a very high level, very very high level. I sleep well. I perform well. Mm -hmm. I'm lean. My abs are out. My quads are out. My obliques are out. Everything's out. I feel good. I look good. My clothes look good. I perform at a high level. When I lose that because of you know life, so on and yeah. so forth, changing priorities, I don't perform at an optimal level. And if I don't perform at an optimal level, I can't provide for my people as well as I can. So um, I think I just got cynical. Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. it. I mean, if mine wasn't part of my program. I wouldn't just randomly own a CrossFit gym, yeah. <laughs> but it's part of the program. And uh, luckily I had it during the pandemic and we're essential. So we were able to keep doing it through that. You, they deemed you essential. Yeah. Drug and rehab, drug and alcohol rehab. They didn't want all those people out on the streets. So yeah, they were, they were fine with them uh, coming, coming to rehab. Oh, so the gym's in the rehab center. Yeah. So I have a CrossFit gym on my property uh, at the center. So, um, we work out there with, as staff, but it's also part of the curriculum with the clients. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So you made yeah, it yeah. because they let you stay open. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Good for you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. You know, who knew drug rehab is essential, but the best part again, <laughs> <Right>. is <laughs> it, it kind of is. Uh, but like I said, the best part was 100%. being able to keep my gym open. So when all the other gyms were shut down, we were able to continue working out, um, which was really good for me and my staff. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're able to do that. I'm also happy that that era in our history is over. Same in you know? every possible way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, when I was doing uh, due diligence with you, I found that you actually love California. Can you can you expand on that? Like, how, you love California? Like, tell me what you love about California. I love the weather. So from where I am in this little podcast studio, about half a mile from here is a national forest. So I can go hiking uh, in the redwood forest with my dogs. Beautiful. And then about a mile from here... Um, well, up until about four months ago when we got destroyed, there's a beach so I could go take off. I told you how we, I do grounding. I take off my shoes, go walk in the sand with my dogs through the waves. Um, so I have the forest and the beach right in my backyard. That's what I love about it. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. 
Um, and the I, weather. I and yeah, the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. It's like constantly what 60, 70 there. It got cold last week. It was in the 30s. We talked <laughs> about this. It was freezing. <laughs> Um, but it, to be a business owner in the state, it is very challenging. It is very difficult. We are highly regulated, highly taxed. It is difficult to survive, no doubt about it. But my my centers, my rehabs are in beautiful locations. So, um, you know, who who wouldn't want to leave Connecticut in the middle of winter and come to rehab in California? You know, I would agree. I, uh, I can imagine that it's probably a nice change of pace, especially from Connecticut. Yeah. Um, I don't know enough about California to really, um, pass judgment. I've been to LA, I've been to San Francisco, I've been mm -hmm. to Northern California where I've seen a lot of redwoods and I didn't realize it's like cowboys up there. Like I went, cowboys. To, my, I went to my buddies. This is a really weird story. Uh, <laughs> I was in the military. So this was early 2000s, mid 2000s, somewhere around there. And my buddy was like, Hey, come home with me. I live in California. And I'm like, Oh, awesome. So when you think of California, you think of California from like the movies, like I had never been before. And we start driving through these like canyons for like hours. And we're in like Northern California and I don't know where, and we you know the, the redwoods and everything and so on and so forth. But we get to the guy's house and we're like in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, I don't understand. Like, where are we? He's like, well, we're in NorCal, Northern California. And I'm like, all right, dude, I think Sasquatch is going to come out. Like we're buried in the woods here. And he asked me, he's like, do you want to go out to a bar? I was like, yeah, get me out of here. Like put me somewhere where people are. And everybody had full cowboy hats and some people had spurs, boot spurs on in the bar. And I was young. I was wearing like Abercrombie and Fitch, like shirts. <laughs> yeah, I was like 20. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But I really didn't fit in. And I had no clue I was going to see that type of individual in California. I had completely judged a book by its cover. It is very diverse. I mean, you're right. There's a lot of agricultural here, which uh, is kind of breeds like a lot of cowboyish type individuals, but yeah, we're, we're pretty diverse. I mean, from the ocean to the forest to just flatland, like it's California is a very large state. It's pretty much your entire East Coast is California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We had no, yeah. I had no concept of that, but now I do, and that's a good way of putting it. So, have you been in California your whole life? No, I'm actually born and raised in Reno, Nevada, which is right over the border. So I, I grew up in Nevada and hating Californians because they came in and drove crazy. So I just ended up driving like them. But um, yeah, ah. no, from Nevada. Moved here when I was 20-ish uh, and kind of been here ever since. Is, is, that, is that time frame about when you opened your rehab centers? No, I... Um, I moved here because my best friend lived here and I was leaving my situation in Reno and came here and we had fun and then left here. And then ultimately I came back here to go to rehab um, because I got myself in a lot of trouble. So I ended up going to the rehab she went to and um, been there ever since. So went in as a client and worked my way up and got through um all of my legal situations and uh, ended up ultimately taking it over. And that's what I've been doing. That sounds like quite a story. Uh, yeah. From the research I did, it looked like around 11 years old. Started drinking and using. Yeah. Yeah. I was a, I was a latchkey kid. So my mom would work two jobs and I had a lot of independence. And with that, I got in a lot of trouble. Early. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was just having fun, but you know, yeah, it was, it was young. Like when I had an 11 year old, I was like, holy crap, that is so young. I can't believe what I was doing, what I was doing at that age. Are you open to discussing what you were using? Of course I am an open book. You can ask me anything you want. So I started out, uh, I think we were uh, drinking and smoking weed. That was the initial stuff, cigarettes. And then I progressed into harder drugs, uh, methamphetamines, crack, LSD, that sort of stuff. That's pretty much where I stayed until I went to rehab, 
and and got actually over all that stuff about 21. What go I guess the right way of asking it is what were your thoughts about life and and using at that time like what goes through someone's head to to like do meth crack and LSD like in their late teens basically like do you remember for me, it was always just about having fun. I'm a very social person and it, uh, you know, growing up in the eighties, like that was considered fun. It was drink party, do crazy shit. And that was just normal. So, um, wasn't thinking with, you know, I, I need to check out of my life or anything like that. For me, it was always just about having fun and how could I have more fun and being around people who are having fun. Yeah, I mean, I guess it wasn't much different growing up in the 90s, right? Like, I don't think the, you know, from my perspective, I don't, the hard stuff didn't come around until, I don't know, 20s, probably, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the shoreline of Connecticut, the, the hard stuff for us was Coke mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. Coke and ecstasy. And um, I, I mean, I had never heard of meth or LSD until years later. Right. Um, pr I probably heard a crack, but I, I understand that. I understand that completely. Now, is that why when I say that, I mean, those experiences going to rehab, is that why you have found yourself in the position that you're in where you have centers and it's nearly 30 years, if I'm not mistaken, of ownership when it comes to these sorts of centers? It definitely put me on that path. But for me, it's about health. Like I grew up, I came into this world with a purpose to help. That's why I came here. That's when I'm the happiest. So this sort of catapulted me into an area of being able to help people who were like me. And so, you know, looking at different life choices or careers, uh, for me, it's like, why would I do anything else? I'm able to make an impact by helping people who were like me. I, I, that is my happy place. So definitely, you know, it put me here, but ultimately my underlying purpose is to help. And this is a perfect way to do it. So you don't think that the familiarity of you, like going through this, understanding it, uh, is the fuel to, to that help? Absolutely. And knowing that I'm providing it in a different way. Okay. So okay. like yeah. what passes as drug rehab these days so is... Yeah. A bunch of pills, a yep. label, you're an addict the rest of your life, you're powerless, yep. go live your life. And these people that have gotten sober in those ways are not happy. They're not productive. They're in fear. And so for me, it's like, Hey, that used to be who you are. So let's overcome your addiction. That's who you used to be. Let's find fitness. Let's take total accountability and responsibility for having created this situation in your life. Cause that's truly the way out of it. When you're allowed to be a victim, it just perpetuates it. You're never causing it. And that's where I really struggle with this. Like addiction is a disease. It's like, I don't know that I agree with that because that sort of allows you to be the victim of something that is being done to you as opposed to something you've created and you can overcome. I think victim mentality has uh, grown pretty strong in societal norms, uh, maybe the past 30 years. Uh, yeah. I was just having this conversation earlier. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to digress into what we were talking about, but I think there's more and more opportunity for humans to be victim and it be okay and, and accepted. Uh, yeah. and, and I think you're talking about a very dangerous uh, victim mentality that costs people their lives quite often. I would imagine, uh, I, I would agree. I, I don't, I don't think addiction is a disease. I would, I would say it's a choice fundamentally, which I think the disease would be in the decision making. You know, um not not that I agree with the decisions, but if we're going to say disease, it's it's terrible decision making. Um Yeah. And I was never an addict, at least I don't think so. Like I barely drink. I mean, it's pretty rare I drink. Uh, I don't use drugs. Uh, I find that I perform at a very high level without alcohol and drugs and I'm clear and I enjoy life without, you know, 
uh, when I was younger, I probably smoked weed every day in high school. I mean, call that the closest thing to an addiction, but, um, I think addiction is cho- it's choice rather than, than a disease. And it sounds like you agree with that. I do. I mean, I definitely think there becomes a point where your choice lessens and it becomes survival, you know, Mm -hmm. in addiction, physically, Mm -hmm. mentally, spiritually, you need it in order to um, do life. And so I think that's where it crosses over from, you know, experimenting or having fun or using once in a while to now where you're dependent on it for your survival. At least you think so mentally. And a lot of times physically, your body says that as well. So Uh, There's definitely a condition there that needs to be handled, but I don't agree that it's a disease or labeling it as a disease actually Mm -hmm. enables people to get better or, or feel like they can overcome it. I feel like, you know, like the way it's presented through most modalities is you're going to suffer from this for the rest of your life, whether you're using or not, you are this person. And that's pretty shitty. That's like saying, you know, all the stupid decisions that I made as a teenager with, I'm going to live with the rest of my life and be defined by that, regardless of, you know, how much progress I made or how much success I have. That's what the department of the VA told me about PTSD. Yeah. Forever. You're just screwed. Like you might as well call me cancer. Like what the hell? What? Yeah. I was like, you know, guys, I'm not a doctor. However, that sounds like bullshit. Right. (laughs) Right. Now, when you, and it was because I healed myself, but that's not the point. When your team and you work with these addicts and and bring them through your centers, what's the likelihood that, I don't want to say graduating percentage, I want to say whatever is the right way of saying it, but what's the likelihood that they can actually get out of their own way and, and, and move through your program and not be addicted to drugs? Our success rate, we, we started tracking. Yeah. We started tracking our success as soon as we created Elevate. So that's been about eight years. And so we track them through the program. And then after they leave and up to like a year or two after they graduate. And so we run like about as 60 to 70% success. Um, whereas traditional rehab, I think it's like 2%, you know, the, so we have a very wow. high success rate. Yeah. But I think again, it's because we address the whole individual body, mind, spirit, the whole thing. And we give them tools like mindfulness that they can take into the world and utilize at any point in time when they're f- going to feel triggered or do something bad, they can find their breath. Um, we give them physical exercise where they get those hits of like that they used to get from drugs. They learn how to get that from exercise. And so we really handle the whole person, the whole being so that they can go out and not just be sober and white knuckling it, but be successful in life and are a participant in life and having a good time and being successful, not just sober, but not knowing what to do with themselves. How about that? You take the same approach to the addicts that I take when I work with people in business. Yeah. The whole shebang. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and again, throw in that whole piece of accountability and responsibility, right? You know, like I know when I went to my first rehab at 16, they allowed me to be the victim. Oh, no wonder you're this way. This was done to you. You're raised like this. You had these hardships. And I was like, yeah, see, that's why, that's why I'm this way. Like I can't possibly change. Look what was done to me. It allowed me to like really use that. And as an addict, you will use anything to forward, you know, you on that path. And we don't allow people to do that. We said, yeah, you've had some pretty shitty things happen, but what did you do? What did you do? I get this happened to you, but how did you handle that? Was that the right thing? No. So let's take responsibility on the decisions that you made spawning out of bad things, which is handling the trauma, but then handling the responsibility for what you did as a response to that. With such a high success rate, does that really help when it comes to people understanding your program and coming to you, like knowing that you're the best in at least the area? You would think so, but it's just not, um, it's not mandatory for rehabs to track their success. So Mm -hmm. the majority of rehabs don't. And so they, when someone's out there comparing rehabs, although we can say that we're the best and we have the proof, that's not a thing that's normal. And so everybody's not held to the same standard. Like I would love it if rehabs had to publish their success so that when people were looking and trying to make a decision, they could easily see which one works. Yeah, that's too bad. And it's not like you get referrals in your business, huh? 
Oh, we do. Yeah. A lot yeah. of our graduates will go on and, and uh, refer people. Parents will refer people like anybody who has familiarity with what we do in the field and aligns with that sort of med- modality definitely refers mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm just getting the, the understanding of it, I guess, uh, you know, being so foreign to it, it it's all intriguing to me. Uh, mm-hmm. I love the fact that you're approximately 50, whatever, 8% higher success rate than, uh, industry average. Do you find that business from a business perspective is more enjoyable because you have such a high success rate? It is. I, my, yeah. my staff. And so I used to think this was like a, a blemish on us. Well, because I was told it was, you know, we, the majority of my staff have all been through the program. They've all overcame their own addictions. And oh, so wow. we're kind of in there leading from the front. Yeah. Wow. And so the clients respond very well to that because they're like, right. Okay. So you didn't just get your degree in a school right. and you're telling me what to do because you learned right. it in a book. Like they can't pull the shit on us. Uh, right. that they would be able to at other places because we've been there. And if we right. could do it, you could do it. And so our response from our clients is bar none. They love the fact that we actually all really do understand and we've all been there and we can actually hold them more accountable because we're not allowing them to be the victim of whatever, because we know they can do it. Yeah. So it would be similar to me teaching how to overcome PTSD. Like I've done 100%. it and the veterans can see it and be like, oh, yeah. He's actually done it. Hundred <laughs> you know? percent. And he hasn't 100%. gone to school for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, they're, and they're way more likely really cool. to believe it. Yeah. 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 That's super cool. So how how big is your staff? Like how, how does this uh, explain to me the model? So I have two residential programs, uh, one in South Lake Tahoe, one in Santa Cruz. And so people come into the program, they do a full blown detox. If they're doing the 30 day, they go to Tahoe. If they're doing the full program, they stay in Santa Cruz. Um, and we deliver the whole program. And then we also have virtual outpatient now. So they'll do step down. So and when they go home, they will then enroll in our virtual outpatient where they can mm. continue getting more and more, you know, group camaraderie program, as they reintegrate back into the world. And then of Mm -hmm. course, people can just do the residential program. They could just do the residential outpatient. There's many different options of how to do it, but we found having that full continuum of care is the most successful. So we try to, you know, be there for them as long as we can. Okay. So sounds fantastic. Like you have this all set up and I, and I love that your staff is, uh, graduates of the program. So let's say like, I want to, I want to shift from the, the actual business to the business of the business, if that makes any sense, because everyone that was listening is involved in business. However, they're generally speaking earlier on the spectrum of, of business ownership and entrepreneurship. So I want to, I want to target some questions that really bring out your perspective when it comes to getting shit done. And and listen, I could sit here and ask you all these questions about the the actual programs and and be super excited because it's going to, you know, ensue emotion and it's really cool to hear. But I just want to take the shift just so we can provide the value, we can provide the impact, we can provide the perspective and influence that everyone listening wants to hear, right? So you are someone who has been in business for uh, three decades, and you've probably gone through your trials and tribulations and very well might be still going through them. Being in business twice as long as I, if you look back at the beginning, let's say the first five years, what was that like? Like, What did life, what did business, what did the program look like? So for me, I came in, I I told you before as a client. And so the first five years I was working under the mentorship of uh, my, my original boss and then another one. And so I took that time to just observe and I watched what was successful, what wasn't successful. I watched what leading from the front looked like. I watched what being a hypocrite looked like, and I did a lot of damage control. So I would I would be the person to sort of fix all the things that the tyrannical or, you know, just 
how my bosses used to be, I was the fixer. So I would go in and, and make everything okay. So for me, the first five years was just, it was, I, I like to associate it with like Star Wars. Like I was learning from the, from the Jedi masters of what to do and what not to do. And that was really the majority of my education that brought me to where I then was able to run it for like the next 25 years based off of what I learned those first five of the right and the wrong ways to do things. So those the, when you were mentoring, that's amazing. And I, I love that you had shitty leadership and you learned that as well. Because <laughs> I mean, it wasn't all bad, but definitely it wasn't all good either. <laughs> yeah, but you have to have that to understand yeah. what not to have. And, and I don't mean shitty. I just mean like not ideal. All right. Now, those five years, was it your company or were you working in it? No, I was working in it. So it was actually a nonprofit that uh, was, uh, went for like 20 years. So, um, I was working in it. Yes. I was like the right hand man of mm -hmm. the executive directors mm -hmm. until they moved on. And then I took it over. Oh, okay. Now, is it still someone like a different entity or is it yours? So we ran that as a nonprofit for about 20 years. And then that company wanted to take things in a new direction that I was not um, confident would equate to uh, success. And so we broke away. Uh, we gave up our licensing and created our own program based off of that 20 years of experience of what we've been seeing works and doesn't work. And that's where I created Elevate. And so did that breakaway and create the new company and actually turned it for profit um, uh, from the nonprofit so that we could look at, you know, expansion and getting partnerships and that sort of thing. So I've ran Elevate uh, as our own program for the last eight years as a for-profit. Got it. Okay. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Was their new venture successful? I would, you know, here's the thing that you don't learn. So all, everything I've learned has been through trial and error. Like I didn't have the formal education. I didn't have a lot of mentorship to learn from after those first five years. And so, no, the problem is, is we broke away and made our own program and our, and went to for profit, but we were then considered to be a new company, even though I had 80 employees. So my weekly uh, you know, nut to survive was at such a high level that uh, as a new company with that necessity to keep running and keep doing things has taken us a lot longer than it probably would any other organization. And then throw in, you know, some pandemics and some other crazy stuff that have happened in the industry in the last eight years because of a bunch of bad players. And it's been, it's been a little difficult to build up the EBITDA um, as opposed to, you know, yeah. That was it. <laughs> Such a high level comment to to build up the EBITDA. I, I, I think it's really, really important that you said that. Most business owners, most entrepreneurs, whatever you want to call it, I don't think they understand the power of building your EBITDA. Uh, building your EBITDA is is the goal. It's, it's not the top line. No one cares about top line. The only people that are going to tell you that top line matters is your ego other people's ego in marketers. That's all. Yeah. That's it. Your top line does not matter. It does not. So put it into perspective. Let's say your top line is a million dollars, but your EBITDA is $950,000. That's what matters. It's not the top line number. It's yeah. the bottom. Yeah. And building the bottom is, is tricky. Yeah. Specifically, if you have a huge staff, because if you have a huge staff, my biggest staff at one time was about 60. So I understand. So if you have 80 people, your payroll is probably quite considerable on a monthly basis. And that's what 50, 60, 70, 80% of your, of your monthly, um, I hate the word expense when it comes to payroll, but technically on a p &L it is. I look at it as an investment, but the point is, if if that's a big piece of your of your P and L on a monthly basis, how do you build your your EBITDA at this position that you're in? Yeah, it's been it's been a challenge because uh, I recognize the value in people. I think human and I and I, I used to struggle with this word human capital. Uh, mm -hmm. but that's what your employees are considered. Mm -hmm. I've always known that's our biggest asset. And when you mm -hmm. can find loyal people, core values, been with you for 10, 20 years, like a lot yep. of my staff, I will do anything to keep them, even yep. if 
times relegate, like your census has dropped down to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. it, it, we're like, you know, uh, you would equate it to like a retirement home or something. You still need 24 mm -hmm. seven care and mm -hmm. all these components all the time, whether you have 20 people, 100 people or 200 people. So there's definitely been times where, uh, you know, our census has gone down, but I've kept the majority of my staff because I recognize the value. And I think, you know, with peaks and valleys and then once we get through this valley, I'm going to need all these people and to go try to get them back. It's going to be too difficult. So for me, yeah, the people are always number one. That is my biggest expense by far, but it's also the thing that keeps people safe, keeps them alive, gives us our products. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're in the service industry. We're not making mm -hmm. widgets. Like people right. is the most important thing. And they can't, yep. the majority cannot be replaced by robots or, you know, VAs or anything else. Like it's the people that are on the ground that are delivering the service. Oh, you can't just, you can't just AI it. Why not? Maybe just, I mean, we can a, AI some maybe, stuff, but not maybe everything. Just, maybe just throw a blue check mark on it and you're good to go. No. <laughs> well, I kind of, I mean, I did do that this weekend. <laughs> did, you, did you see, did you see that Instagram made $700 million in one day from it? Uh, I mean, I, I contributed to it. I was like, Oh, 15 bucks a month. That's way better than the 20 K a month. People were charging like two months ago. I know that's, they tried to get me with that. They're like, Oh, Chris, we'll, we'll get you into Forbes. Yeah. We'll, we'll write, uh, um, Wikipedia and you're such a great coach. We'll get you a blue check mark. I'm like, uh -huh. and what does this cost? Oh, just 30 grand. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. No. Yeah. But you can't like you can't. I'm joking about the blue check mark, but you can't hate on Instagram. Seven hundred million dollars in one day at a fifty. What is it? Fifteen dollar price point. Yeah. Can we? So like, smart. Can we do something like that, please? Yeah, exactly. Just one time. I'd be sad. <laughs> I'd have my EBITDA. I'd have my the staff paid for. I'd have all that money for marketing. It'd be amazing. <laughs> you know, like, and this is a complete digress, but a company like Facebook, which owns Instagram, they've capitalized on having a free marketplace. Yeah. Right? I mean, they fundamentally, they're data collectors is what they are, but they've been, they've said they were going to stay free for the user and they are still free. Mm -hmm. So when they come out with things like this, it's a huge hit. I mean, almost a billion dollars in a day type hit. Like talk about needing to build EBITDA. So going back to um yeah. going back to what you said. So at the height of my career where I was my payroll was 30 to $35,000 a month. I, you know, I used to look at that three to, you know, 400 grand year annually on my returns and be like, man, that is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And my perspective at that time was just trying to understand that the humans are an investment. We're talking 2016, 2017, right? So I was, I was still learning. It's in my early thirties. And, you know, I thought cutting back on payroll, what was going to help me yeah. build my bottom line. I didn't understand my bottom line well enough to make those types of decisions, but that was my decision making. So you're saying it's the exact opposite to invest into your humans and your team to build your bottom line or EBITDA, which is what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I have to admit, I've also hit times where our census has dropped and I've had to talk to my entire executive team and say, Hey, it's rough right now. We got to, we got to take a 25% pay cut for, I'm not sure how long until we pull out of this and they've done it with me several times. And they so, sacrificed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the purpose. That's the core values. That's having a team that understands the bigger picture. And, um, you know, we've pulled out of it. So, yeah, I mean, for me, the team is everything. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, my it's family. A, team yeah. is everything. Yeah. Yeah. Do you manage by core values? Absolutely. We hire fire three strikes. We do the whole traction thing. Um, and we have, you know, our signs posted everywhere. Like, yeah, core values are huge for us. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, have to lead by the front, of course. Do you discuss core values regularly? Yeah. Every Friday night we have our staff meeting. 
half of it's live for the people on the ground, half of it's virtual. It's not half and half. It's all yeah, one meeting, right. but we're we're integrated hybrid ways. And uh, one part of the meeting we talk about is core value shout outs. So we will ask everybody, have you witnessed anybody on staff displaying one or more of the core values this week? And everybody sort of goes around, not everybody, but a lot of people will chime in. Yes, I want to acknowledge, um, you know, detox, hardworking and fun. We had 13 clients this week and I know it wasn't easy, but the clients didn't know that. And they came down saying what a positive experience it is. So, you know, core value shout out to the detox staff. So stuff like that, where we're constantly acknowledging one another for displaying core values. That's amazing. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Um, eight years ago, when you took it over yourself, did you do that with your company? Yeah. So our prior modality had uh as a similar thing it was it was like a core value so yeah we translated that because very soon on of becoming the for-profit and starting the new company um we did traction which had you list out your core values so it's pretty much been the the entire time we've had this we've had yeah. core values yeah and for anyone that doesn't know traction is actually an excellent book when it comes mm -hmm. to many things to include how to run a business uh, yeah. with a very structured manner. I have, I have one copy here. So a lot, a lot of books, I have multiple copies and you know, I send them out, but, uh, excellent book recommendation. Would you agree? Absolutely. Like yeah. I said, we, uh, because of it, we hire fire strikes. Like that's, that means discipline. Um, yeah. We, if you don't have those metrics or those accountabilities, and I'm shocked mm. how many people in our entrepreneur world don't have any like mm. formal type of managing system. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, and I'll hear their frustrations. This guy keeps doing this, keeps doing that. I was like, well, okay, give them a strike. Tell them what they're doing wrong. Reference your core values. They're like, what? <laughs> that's a thing. I'm like, dude, how do you manage without it? Like, I don't understand how you discipline people or you handle people without some point of reference. And how yeah. do they know where they stand as employees yeah. without some point of reference? You're, you're absolutely right. And uh, this is this topic is discussed a lot with high level business people. It almost gets redundant. But for entry level business people that are listening and don't have core values set, the first step is to set your core values. The second step is to do exactly what we're talking about, which is managed by them. So here's an interesting question for you. Do you have like a grace period? For instance, you hire someone, they're in their 90 day period, they're in their six month period, their first year period. Do you look at it like, all right, well, we have this three strike system. However, do you have a grace period because they're new to your company? No, uh, it is what it is. It, we have to hold a hard line because if people see the new guy getting away with shit that they can't get away with shit, then it's not going to go well. So we have to hold a hard line regardless. And like I said, the majority of our staff minus like the nurses and different things like that have come through the program. So mm -hmm. they're expected to do from day one, exactly what everybody else in the company mm -hmm. is expected mm -hmm. to do. Love it. I love this. This is amazing. Can you tell me about your core values? Yeah. So uh, I already said we have hardworking and fun. We have purpose driven, uh, constant strive for personal growth because, you know, we came through as a drug rehab where they put a lot of time and energy into personal yep. growth. Well, we don't yep. want that to stop just because mm -hmm. now you're sober. It's like you got to continue growing. So uh, continued strive for personal growth is one of our core values. Um, we have uh, selflessly. I can't even read my sign over there. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. um, yeah, selfless or sel selflessly leading. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, responsible for themselves and their environment, because uh -huh. a big part of that is, is, you know, we, we wordsmith it to have, not only are you accountable for yourself, but you're also accountable for what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking of, you see I'm off work, but this client yeah. looks like they're struggling. You don't just walk by them and be like, I'm on break. You have to stop and say, what can I do to help this person? Even if I'm quote unquote on my break, like we have to take accountability for ourselves and everything around us. So that's a big one for us as well. I'll, I'll tell you this, this is amazing. I'll tell you this funny story. You're going to appreciate it. I don't know if I told you this, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were all together in person. Um, uh, I was at this mastermind in January. It was an author mastermind. You had to be, you had to be an entrepreneur and or author. Most people were authors. Anyways, we're in there and there's this guy next to me 
he just exited his third company at 400 million. Right? <laughs> yeah. Software, California. Yeah. Anyways, um, we get on the topic of core values and I start talking about management by core values and everyone's like, what? Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? What? And they're like, what are you talking about? CW? So I teach exactly what we're talking about. Right? I'm, I'm a student in this mastermind, but I'm, I'm teaching. Right. And yeah. even the, even the guy who was holding the mastermind who sold like 10 million books. He's a New York times bestselling author. He's like, Whoa, you know, um, <laughs> uh, shout out to Bob Berg. He's been on the show. He's a buddy of mine. Um, mm -hmm. but anyways, so the, the guy that just sold his company for $400 million, he's like, Chris, uh, I really don't agree with anything you have to say outside of this core value talk. And, but I respect you. And I'm like, yeah, cool. You're from California. You probably have no clue what's going on in the world. And, uh, <laughs> wow. I, was, I was like, I was like trying to take a dig at you. Oh, I know uh, you've, you've got several for me that can yeah, take and, uh, <laughs> and he's like, you know, but can I ask you about the core value stuff? And I was like, yeah, what do you want to know? He's like, what do you mean managed by him? I'm like, well, well, think about it. If, if, if I walk up to you and I say, Hey, Jay, listen, man, uh, you know, uh, that was a really good job being respectful with, uh, Angie because she's, you know, she's, she's going through a tough time right now. And, uh, you were being very respectful to her in that, in that time frame. Um, when you interacted with her and I saw that and, and you're guiding, you're operating by the core value of respect. And he's like, Oh, he goes, let me ask you something. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, how often do you and your team talk about core values outside of the management? And I was like, Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's not seldom, but it, there's no structure to it. He goes, my last company was 1,200 people. Every single time we had a meeting at every single level, the first five minutes of it was opened up by going around the room, talking about core values. Each person had to say a core value. I was like, ooh, I like that a lot. And he's like, yeah, it worked really, really well, and we didn't have to manage by it. Yep. And I was like, hmm, interesting. So I didn't agree with you didn't have to manage by it. However, I've never had a team of 1,200. Maybe there was other ways that they managed people, right? You don't have to only manage people by core values, but I implemented that. And this was in January when I learned this. And the interesting part about it is the decision-making among my team, I've always told them, if you're going to make a decision, make a decision by the core values. It, the decision-making has gotten better and the alignment to the core values has gotten better. So going back, if I, I wish I had core values in my first decade, I didn't, I yeah. didn't. And I don't know about you, but going back to earlier CW as like a gung ho personal trainer and nutritionist and, and then gym owner, I wish I had core values in place. Sounds like you had that in place from the start. Yeah. And I think that's why I've been able to be successful because we had something, uh, you know, back in my old company, it was called the code of honor or something like that, but if, it, it's all I've ever known. And I think that's why I've been so successful and able to, you know, guide and lead through even giving pay cuts, even everything else, because of that strong camaraderie where you all believe in the same thing, you're all rowing in the same direction, and you can very easily spot who is not living, leading and living that life. Mm -hmm. And it makes it like those decisions very easy. Like we could have somebody we're disciplining um, and it's like, listen, they're just not a core value fit. Like they got to go. They don't have genuine compassion for others. They're kind of assholes or they're, they're not purpose driven. They're sort of lackadaisical. They got to go. So it just makes, it takes out the decision-making out of everything because everybody either is a hundred percent in or the ones that are out stand out right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Culture, they stand right out of the culture. We actually just had someone leave uh, because of culture. They, we didn't even have to get rid of them. They just couldn't, they just yeah. couldn't align. The culture just pushed you right out. Yeah. And that makes it easy. You take, it takes away all the <laughs> like, oh, I don't know, should we, or yep. shouldn't we? It's like, it's a very easy decision. Yeah. Three this quarter, actually. 
or last quarter, actually, Q1. And it is, it's not like it's not like a, a burnt bridge thing. It's just, hey, listen, we don't align. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Like you'll probably yeah. be awesome somewhere else. Just you got to you got to be this way with us. It's just the way it comes down to because this is how we operate. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, and that that's actually a powerful statement, right? When your culture pushes people out. It's a powerful thing. It means that everybody else believes in it. Yeah, for sure. And and we love that. And I, I can't tell you, I've even hired recently like business development people who they love coming to our staff meetings just to see the culture, just to yep. see everybody believing in and buying it and, and thinking the same way and sort of pumping each other up in a positive way um, while still doing the job that we do because drug rehab is not an easy job. It's 24 seven. You're dealing with a lot of personalities. We're dealing with a lot of crap. And so, you know, one of our core values is hardworking and fun. Because what we don't want is the clients to think that, you know, coming to rehab is a miserable experience. We want our staff to lead from the front in a positive manner, as opposed to a clinical and depressing manner, which is what all these people just came from. It's not what they need in their environment. Impressive. Um, I, uh, I, I think we should revisit this, um, you know, at some point, whether it's later this year or next year, um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm coming. I was I'm coming out to keynote in California. I just found out. Wait, you're actually going to come to California? They want me to be a keynote at the National Hispanic Real Estate Agent Conference, and I was like, "You, you sure you want me? Like I'm white? Yeah, you're as white like, as they get. Like what? I'm like as <laughs> white as it gets, and they're like." No, we're all fans of you. You're awesome. We follow you. We've read your book. We listen to your podcast. Will you keynote for us? And I'm like, wow, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Impressive. But, but here, here's the, here's the cool thing about it, right? You know, uh, Powell, my executive director, my uh, creative director. Mm -hmm. uh, I told her, I said, listen, there's going to be like 500 people. Um, you need to really help me on my Spanish. I want to open up the speech with Spanish and I want to close it with Spanish. And wow. I've, I've never done that on stage, spoken, wow. a, spoken a different language. Yeah. And, uh, actually in a couple of weeks, me, her, and my president, we're all going to a speaker's school. I've mm -hmm. been through speaker school, but I'm bringing them to speaker school. So we're like, we're taking it real serious. So September 7th, I'm going to be at in San Francisco for that, um, for that speech. And, uh, when I come out there, uh, maybe I could show you how to do some pull-ups and, um, we could talk about <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, listen, you got to show up to the workout to uh, actually learn. I was on West coast work. time. Damn it. It was like three in the morning after traveling. Like you got to give me a little latitude. At least I carried Tom. Like what more do you want from me? That was like all I needed to do. Touche. Touche. <laughs> So listen, I, you will be very close. So you're uh, San Francisco is only about an hour from me. So yeah. you'll have to come over. I can show you the center. We can do um, uh, yeah. in-person podcasts. It'll, yeah, be, it'll it. be awesome. Yeah, let's do it. And it, let's do it. Definitely. And in the meantime, let's say anyone wants to follow you, understand a little bit more about you, check out your amazing podcast, which you just had me on. And it sounds like we're lining up with number two. Um, how do we, how do we get a hold of you? How does someone find you? Well, you look for the blue check. I now have. <laughs> you paid your $15. Heck yeah, I did. I'm like done Facebook and Instagram. You got oh, me yeah. on both. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. On Facebook, it's Angie Manson on uh, Instagram. It's uh, Angie going rogue, which is the name of my podcast. Mm -hmm. Just reach out to me, DM me on there. If you need help, go to mm -hmm. elevate rehab.org. There's 24 yep. seven. Uh, there's like a little chat person. There's a phone number. Um, LinkedIn, all that stuff. You can find me. I have a website, angiemanson.com. So um, not hard to find. I'm the girl with the purple hair. And just to be fully transparent, your podcast is pretty legit considering you just had Andy Frisella on your show. Yeah, pretty, pretty legit. That was uh, definitely a highlight for sure. Now I'm going to start pestering him about getting on his, but um, yeah, <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> yeah. What's, what does that look like? How do you get on the MFCEO? I mean, the um, uh, real AF. I don't know. I got, I got to start it. I'm going to reach out to Emily because uh, she and I, she and I are, I, we get along well. We're very yeah. similar. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. you know, she's the gatekeeper. I, that's where I go. 
Yeah, he's got a few of them is what I've what I've learned. And uh, mm-hmm. if you get in good with the gatekeepers, you can get in good with him. But rightfully so. He should have gatekeepers. Um, but enough about him. He's awesome. Everyone knows him. You're awesome, which is what's most important. So thank you for I feel like we just got started. But you know what? You know, giving time restraints. Thank you for your um, your perspective on everything and explaining your business. And I really am impressed how your entire staff is, or the majority of your staff is all graduates of the program that you have. And um, you know, we'll let it slide that you have a CrossFit gym, and uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll just give you props for all the awesome things that you're doing. And I, I just want you to know that I do appreciate you and. I am grateful for your time and just wanted to thank you for coming on the show and, and educating everyone. Awesome. Thank you for having me on. I enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I got to so, go. I got to go CrossFit now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you Until see next your time. logo? Like I was like, what should I wear? I'm going to, I'm going to wear the, the shirt with the logo that you, you guys created for me for my podcast. I remember when we made that, it was like, what was it early last year? Yeah. I, uh, I, it's such a long story, but my, my, I have a creative team. I have a branding team, right? I would never consider myself a consultant on branding. However, my team is all artists and they specialize in branding. So somewhere along the way, uh, they have gotten wildly popular when it comes to anything branding related. And uh, I remember when we did yours, I was like, because they're they're a bunch of you know they're they're girls and I, ladies. I was like, girls, like you fucking killed it with this logo. Like, does she like it? And they're like, yeah, she loves it. Because I think you sent over like, um, was it um, Wonder Woman at first or yeah, yep. Wonder Woman, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. So yeah, awesome logo. I mean, I, I see it hanging in the background. I wasn't gonna give myself a plug, but <laughs> I, I appreciate the plug. Yeah, that's what that's why I'm here. No, yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you the story. Do we have just one yeah. second? Yeah, lay it on me. So I got to evolve and this girl comes running up to me and I had missed my flight. It was a long drive. My Uber driver was lost. Like I was like kind of spent. I was, you know, you were traveling. Because, yeah. And I missed my. Yeah, I was. It was not. And I hadn't eaten all day. Anyway, this girl comes running up to me. She's like, Angie, hi, do you know who I am? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no. She's like, I work for you. I'm like, wait, you do? <laughs> I should know who you are. You work for me. And she's like, yeah. Do you know from where? And I'm like, shit, dude, I don't know. I mean, our marketing, I'm trying to think of the people that I haven't met because obviously if I'd met them in person, yeah, I would right. know who they are. So I'm going through all this list. And then she's like, no, I'm Paola. I created your logo. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my God. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. But um, from that point on, she and I hit it off. We're like besties. We get along so good. She is amazing. And I love her. I remember when we were all having dinner that night and I like came over to talk to you guys and you were like grabbed me and like pulled me in. And I was like, shit, I'm stuck. You know, oh, but, come on. It wasn't yeah. that bad. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, poor me. Um, I know, right? You know what they do? I don't know if you know these things, you know, before we jump off here, they actually hand draw everything. So like a good, the reason why some logos are way more expensive than others is because generic logos are just pumped out of a, of a, of a computer system. Yeah. Just like clip art, right? Just clip art. Exactly. And and, you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, hundred bucks, whatever. But if you invest in a hand drawn logo like yours, not, not like pen and paper, they have like illustrating software. It just comes out fantastic. Like it's like killer stuff. This yeah. is 17 colors. Wow. Yeah. Just like yours. Yours is amazing. So, yeah, uh, yeah I uh, I remember when they made that and I was like, you you guys killed it. So Yeah. Well, and it was fun just to be able to have that creative freedom. Like, no, change your shoes to be more like Converse. No, change your things not to be so leathery, but more like CrossFit. Like, it was, it was super fun on my part, too, just yeah. to have that creative expression mm-hmm. realized. Cause yeah. I'm not an artist. I'm like the opposite right. of an artist. So Same. cool to yeah. have people that can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. They just did one uh, called donuts and deadlifts oh, and it's a, uh, it's a bunch of Rangers that have a company and uh, they got like this big Jack dude, like Johnny Bravo, Jack dude, like doing deadlifts with Ranger panties on and like a donut. And they were like <laughs> donuts on the size. They, where the they were changing so the sprinkles on the donut. And I was like, <laughs> 
you guys are silly. <laughs> <laughs> so good. No, because like, I don't I don't do anything for the branding. I just lead them, right? Yeah. And they just if they if you were like Chris, do a logo, I'd be like, you want a stick figure? What do you want? Right. Is exactly. that that's what you want? I'll give it to you for free. How's that sound? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool to be able to watch. And she loves everybody that she that you know we have the ability to work with, and we're like you know super grateful and. You know how we are with like our thank you cards and our wax seal and and all that stuff. Like she puts all the thought into it. She does calligraphy for for yeah. every thank you card. She does wax stamp and seal. She does it all herself. She never understood. Uh, the team never knew about thank you cards until they started working with me. I've been doing thank you cards for over ten years. Wow. And uh, and then I just showed them. I'm like like this is why we do it. You know, and this is like, look at these messages back to us. This is why we do it. Mm -hmm. And then they just took it like, I, I'm, I'm a little biased, but our thank you cards are elite level. There's calligraphy on the front of it. Everything's hand signs. Everything's connected to the person personally. And it's a wax seal stamp on the back of it. I mean, it's just like God yeah. tier, if that makes any sense. It's but, true. Uh, I'm pretty sure I kept mine, even though yeah. I, I I don't need to be keeping that. But yeah. I'm pretty sure I kept it. I was like, how do you throw this away? Is this is yeah. so nice. I, and I have <laughs> yeah. your note that I have to send you a new book, so you're gonna yes. get a uh, you're gonna get another one here. We just I, just like you did. We just closed out Q1, so we're like trying to catch our breath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Exactly. Uh, so amazing. Thank you grateful yeah, you. for you. And, um, until next time. All right. Deal. We'll talk soon. You got any, got any final words? Oh man. I would just say final words. I, if anybody needs help, reach out for help. Don't be too proud. Don't think that, um, you're, anybody's going to think any less of you. And, and also likewise, if you see somebody struggling, reach out to them. Don't think they have it all figured out. That's usually not the case. So let's just help each other get through all this thing Vulner we call life vulnerability, vulnerability, yeah. and, and, uh, not letting ego get in the way of asking for help. Well said, yep. well said. And, and, and thank you again. Yeah. Thanks.